I'm ready. Pulling up the notes, clicking the button, hitting that button. Here we go. Corley Moore, Firehouse Vigilance Weekly Scrap, number 156. Today's guest, none other than the Mike Dugan, 27-year veteran of the FDNY. He served as captain of Ladder Company 123 in Crown Heights in Brooklyn before he retired. Through his career, he worked on Ladder 42 in the South Bronx. He was a firefighter on Ladder 43 in Spanish Harlem. Uh, this man's accolades on the job are impressive, and it's a very long list. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna list off a few. Of them. Recipient of the James Gordon Bennett Medal in 1992, the Harry M. Archer Medal in 1993, which is the FDNY's highest award for bravery. As if that's not enough, he is also in the volunteer service. Has been involved in the fire service for over 48 years. FDIC instructor sits on the executive board. Edits. Uh, he is an expert on truck company ops. He travels around the country. Highly sought after speaker. Building construction. Size up in today's fire service. And is all that is not enough. Last year, the Tommy Brennan Lifetime Achievement Award at FDIC. My brother, Mike Dugan. It is my pleasure to have you on as the guest of Weekly Scrap Number 156. Well, thank you very much, brother. It's my pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. Should be a lot of fun. It is going to be fun. Is there anything I, I admit, you, brother? Your your resume or your your uh, your bio is impressive. So I I just tried to grab the the highlights. But is there anything you'd like to add? No, because I'm just a dumb kid from New York who became a fireman, and I was just surrounded by great people. Who, you know, if you surround yourself with great people, they bring your level up. So I was surrounded with great people who brought my level up and made me a better fireman and really taught me how to be a fireman. That is phenomenal, man. I love it. Okay, I'll do my housekeeping right here out the gate. We've got uh, Kyle Romagus, of course, is greeting all of the guests or, or, or curating the guests, uh, the audience, as you ask questions. If you have questions for Mike or myself, throw them into the chat so that Kyle can throw them here and we can answer them. Uh, let me do the... Uh, sponsorship because this episode is brought to you by key hose the hose experts check them out on facebook the hose experts elkhart brass a safe fleet brand affordable drill towers home of the affordable drill tower and the affordable standpipe prop it is firefighter owned and operated the only thing you can't do on an affordable drill tower is live fire affordable drill tower you can repel stretch hose Go through the stairs, go through the floor, do window bailouts, cut holes in the roof props, use the apartment balconies, pump into the FDC, or flow water from the sprinkler system. Call Steve. He's a heck of a guy at 844-55-TOWER or drop an email to him at info at affordabledrilltowers.com. And then the other one I'm excited for, Fire Mall Tools, Innovative Solutions. Uh, home to the Fire Wrap Grip Kit, the Fire Mall, the Mauler, the Reaper. I mean, they have some cool names for some tools. But if that's not enough, the new TSR Halligan Bar. They are firefighter owned and operated. Fire Mall Tools is producing the most purpose-driven tools and equipment on the fire ground. They are fighting hard for made in the USA and want to know where is your tool made. Go to firemall.com today and use the promo code SCRAP to save. So go there. Use the word S-C-R-A-P. Anybody can spell it. SCRAP at firemall.com. All right. Housekeeping done. We're ready to rock and roll. We have into people. It. People are logging in. Okay. They're absolutely saying, they're saying, let's go. This is going to be great from Steve Kaiser. De Donald Lee Moore said, let's get some knowledge. Reagan Underwood said, mentor of mentors. Jason Hulveman, <laughs> Chief Jason Hulveman said, and an even better man and friend than all of that. Love that guy. Well, Beautiful. there are some good people there. All right. Michael K. Sandal said, what an amazing gentleman. Was lucky to pick Mike up at the Indy Airport for FDIC and had a great discussion to his hotel. Good times, man. Okay. Good times. I always ask guests, you know, what they want to talk about. And they always send in topics and things. And I try to research them and ask intelligent questions. And I'm very excited for today. Uh, you have a, a breadth of uh, lifetime of, of in the fire service. So I'm just going to start right out the beginning and talk about operations and how they have changed throughout your career and what you've seen and noticed. Uh, basically, what is the biggest change you've seen since you came on the job? Um, the biggest change would have to be that we're now listening to science. Um, there is stuff out there that's happening. Today, I was at the New York City Fire Academy with Bobby Halton for the Lithium Ion Battery Symposium, day one. I got to go back. Got to get up at 5 a.m. tomorrow morning 
to uh, get back and get into the fire academy again. We're listening to science. We're th- seeing things change. Um, you know, a lot of firemen like things the way they were. But the real thing, the one of the things I love is firemen hate the way things are, but they hate change even more. Right. So uh, things have changed. I mean, I remember riding the back step as a young volunteer firefighter. When I got into New York City for a while, we rode in the phone booth. And if anybody know, doesn't know what the phone booth was, it was a little booth on the side of the, fo- the ladder that looked like a phone booth. And one guy stood in there. And oh, you wow. didn't have a seatbelt, but it was the coolest place to be because you were riding in a seatbelt. So we changed things when we found out we were hurting guys. So change happens in the fire service. And there's a lot of change, but a lot of the change that has come through has been good. You know, everybody was like, oh, bunker gear, we're going to have heart attacks. It hasn't been proved. Okay, bunker gear is saving guys and girls' lives every day. Okay, Um, I remember one of my friend's father said, you know, they destroyed the fire department. You know what his father was bitching about? They put a radio on the fire truck, on the fire truck. Not even guys having portable radios. They put a radio on the fire truck so they could call you and make you go to a run. So they could check up on you. They were spying on you with a radio, with the tube set radio. Okay. And I mean, we change things all the time. So the fire service is always changing and we shouldn't be afraid of that change. But I think that the science and the education and getting to look at some of the things and how it's impacting our operations is huge. And very honestly, I mean, the things that have changed since I was a kid that when I started at 18 and the volunteers, was I remember they used to say, oh, my God, the ceiling temperature could be up to 600 degrees. 600 degrees is a walk in a park these days. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, we're talking 2000, 2200 degrees inside a a fire room. So things are changing. So, um, again, we have to embrace that. We have to look at it and see how it works for your organization, no matter whether you're the volunteers, you're small, you're New York City, we're uh, resource rich. You have to look at how things happen. Beautiful, man. No, and I think the science is uh, the especially the UL NIST and all this, all the under, you know, uh, all the FSRI studies going on and the the actual tactics being or the, the, the street wisdom being backed up by the science or you know uh qualifying the science is beautiful right yeah uh is there anything that has surprised you the most in uh that like you never saw coming throughout throughout uh any technology or whether it be tactics or people what what what, what's been the biggest surprise to you if hindsight being what it is biggest surprise to me with the tactics i remember going to a fire in a place called Schomburg Plaza, where we lost seven people in, I think it was 87, maybe 80, 87. I think it was 87. And we had a wind-driven fire. We did, didn't know it was a wind-driven fire. The door was chattering with the wind. It was on the 34th and 35th floor. It started in a compactor, and because the building was not built to New York City code, it was built to a federal code, they had single wall sheetrock around the compactor and it got into the apartments in this one line, in the L line of apartments. But the apartment door was glowing cherry red. And the peephole in the apartment door had burnt out. The brass lock on the apartment door had burnt out. Oh, wow. And we were there and we were forcing, we tried to go down with two, two and a halfs and we got knocked off the fire knocked off the floor because you got the door open a little bit, all the heat came down, burned the guys. And we were in, you know, um, three quarter coats, rubber boots, no hoods. Okay. With the Garrity lights. And if your Garrity light melted, you knew it was hot. Well, my Lieutenant at the time made a call, which I thought was, I never really thought about it, but he said, go force the adjoining apartment door. And I'm sitting there with a guy I worked with by a guy by the name of black guy, by the name of Kirk Lester, who was one of the best firemen I ever worked with. And Kirk looks at me, and I think it was Kirk. Kirk tells me to this day it wasn't him. It was the lieutenant, Jimmy the Greek Scarcus. 
But somebody said, you big donkey son of a gun, hit that Halligan hard and let's get through this door. And we got through the door and my lieutenant got us into the adjoining apartment right next to it. OK, and said, pop a hole in the wall. We popped a hole in the wall and he had the engine take a two and a half. 45 seconds, a minute. The fire was knocked down enough for us to get in the apartment and cool it down. So the it doesn't surprise me that it works. What surprised me about the tactics and the technology is that a lot of guys didn't like like the floor below nozzle didn't like the tools that we were using, the window blanket to stop the window from coming in. The technology is brilliant. But we were like, no, 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 we're going to mess down that hallway. And I've been to a couple of fires where the first two engine companies down the hallway got burnt. We pulled them out, put two more down the hallway. They got burnt. We pulled them out, put two more down. The, the third two companies going down the hallway got to put the fire out. Not because they were better than the other engine companies, because the fuel load diminished enough that they could now. So the technology, the tactics coming to an agreement on when we've got to do certain things that surprised me the most that we veteran firefighters in a lot of places fought this. You know, and we fight things that are proven to work where we can show it working. So I think. It's that sometimes we want us things to stay the way they are, and we don't believe what's obvious. Do you think it's just trying to hold on, just hold on to what it is, and, and, and that's where our yes. comfort zones, our comfort zones, I guess is what I'm trying to say? Yeah, our comfort zones and our, we've always done it that way. Right. You it's know, always worked. Always, yeah. If you've always done it that way and always gotten hit in the head, maybe it's time to not open up the door right into your notes, you know? <laughs> You know, the, it's the, the way it is. So, um, you know, it's interesting. It's fun. But a lot of times we have to look at these tactics and these technologies. I remember guys saying, oh, the thermal imaging camera is too heavy. Well, the thermal imaging camera, when it started, was a brick. It was an anchor. But it was still a great tool. Now, the technology, I mean, the size of these things, it's amazing how good they are. Uh, Dustin Rourke said, is it, is it, is it pride? I don't know if it's pride. I don't know. Um, it could be part of it is pride. We've always gotten it done it that way, but I think part of it is also that we liked coming up with the idea of fixing this ourselves. And now that scientists and these people are saying, well, Try this way. What the hell does that idiot know? He right. never crawled the hallway. He, yeah, but he knows what the water is doing in, in relation to everything else. And I think it's, I don't always think it's just pride, but pride is part of it. Piece of okay, it. it's, it's comfort, it's pride, and it's um, not wanting someone else to tell us how to do things. You know, the, the biggest thing is you can talk to firemen all day long about, a great book, a self-help book. And they go, oh, no, we don't need that. We don't need that because we don't need help. We're firefighters. Okay. Why do firefighters love Jerry Springer? Because you're not that screwed up when you look at the people on Jerry Springer. Yeah. That makes you feel normal. Yeah. That's an everyday life in my family. Right on. Uh, okay, first, well, the, technically Dustin's question was the first question, but here's here's one coming at you from Chief David Pruitt down in Texas Way. He said, Captain, if you could bring back one thing from your years on the job that science or technology could now make safe, what would it be? I would love to see open cabs again. If they could make open cabs safe, that would be a blast. I would love that. Now, in Texas, I got to be honest with you. I was down in Arlington with you, and when we got out into Steve's truck at Red 122, I wouldn't want to be on a black leather seat on an open cab truck in Texas in June or July, and I had to sit back down. I need my bunker gear to put my butt on that seat. So, I mean, I, I like open cab trucks. I love the old open cab Mack trucks. I love some of the older styles of the rigs without all the computers. But I think one of the things we have to do is it get back to – 
making some of the equipment less technology driven. Okay. I like the technology for studying it and understanding it. But one of my favorite pictures that I use in a lot of my presentations is a picture I took at LaGuardia airport in the men's room. And if any of you travel like I do, and you go to the men's room, you're always waving your hand under that thing to get the towels to come out and they never come out. Well, I walked into this airport bathroom and it was a four foot pile of towels. The machine had spit out every towel that was on the roll and it was on the floor. And I always say to people, remember, technology fails. So we, the, the thing that I would like to bring back is some stuff on the basics where we have the stuff to do our job if we don't have the technology. Hmm. Ooh, I like that a lot. I like that a lot. Um, I wanted to see. There's more. Yeah. Scrolling through the comments because Chief Hobbleman said one thing I wanted to pull out here. Mike is also incredibly knowledgeable about building and fire codes and building systems, a totally well-rounded fire officer. So he was making a compliment to you, which is a right. great compliment. But um, I, it, it made me want to ask a question about, uh, of course, building construction is changing. I mean, it's, oh always, my God. it's always changing. But also the younger people that were getting into the fire service aren't really coming from the trades as much as they used to. What is your take on this and what's what's the direction we need to go to uh, – I know you know the importance of understanding building construction. So how do we, how do we address this issue? Is what I'm trying to get at. I think you address it through drills. Uh, building construction, you go into buildings. If you have a building going on in your district and it's being constructed, and you aren't there once a week, you're doing yourself and your crew a disservice. Go in and see what they're doing. What are they putting in? Are there holes in the floor? Because at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, you don't want to be crawling through that building and find out then that there's something going on that you had no idea about, that they're doing something. They're pouring concrete, and they have uh, wooden forms. They don't do that very often anymore, but they used to use wooden forms, and they covered them with oil to make the concrete not stick to the forms. Well, we had you have a fire in that, and you got tons of wet concrete over your head. You want to know about this. You want to go into those buildings and see how they're being put together. What's going on? And then you want to ask questions in those buildings. How is the system going to work? In New York City, we got buildings going in now and our standpipe zone, our heights of our standpipes are limited to 300 feet. 300 feet high. We have some buildings that have four zones. Where is the water coming in? How are we going to get the water up on that floor that we need? The internal building pumps have to bring that up. There has to be enough pipe. There has to be, you have to think about the loss of pressure due to the head pressure coming back down, which is the gravity. Sure. We used to say five pounds per floor to go up. Well, there's five pounds of pressure per floor going down. So you're in a 110 story building. Figure out how many pounds of pressure that is going down, okay? Yeah. And you've got to overcome that. How are you getting those things up there? You have to ask these questions. How are the elevators going to work? How am I going to get to these people? Now, I'm getting older, okay? And walking downstairs, okay? If we're in a high-rise building and I have to walk down 20 or 30 floors, I mean, it's going to be an issue. I have walked up when I was much younger in the first attack on the World Trade Center, I walked up 50 floors, okay? But you have to be able to figure out how you're going to get resources, people, and everything to there. And what are you going to need to fight a fire? I always say you're going to need a high-rise fire, okay? You're going to need three things. You're going to need air, water, and manpower. Water through the standpipe. You have to be able to that the standpipe gets it. You have to have some kind of air resource available to get your air there. I love the FAR system that they do in those things, but whatever it is, whatever air source you have, you can't be taking your firefighting people and having them carry bottles up because it will be a huge problem for you because you're giving away firefighters resources to get another resource. So you're going to cripple two of your legs of what you need. So you have to have some kind of idea of how you are going to fight these fires. Whatever the building is, it could be a McMansion. Look at some of the uh, line of duties, the fatal fire reports. Look at uh, Arnie Wolf in Green Bay in the McMansion. He fell through the floor. In a 
single family home. Now it was big. It was huge. Okay. It took 19 hours to recover his body. Wow. Okay. You have to understand these things. You have to understand these buildings. What are they doing? And what doomed Arnie was they put a marble terrazzo type floor over on the first floor over the basement. And the fire was in the basement. They went in on the first floor and the floor gave way because the wooden supports underneath in a private dwelling gave way. You have to know how your buildings are built. If you are not spending time doing that, you're doing yourself and your people a disservice. Beautiful. That was not even a planned question. That was just kind of off the top of my head as far as uh, I wanted to. Uh, yep. You've seen a lot of rookies grow into firefighters in your, in your career. What is your big takeaway on the differences through the years? Not much. Not much. I think all of the men and women who are in the fire service, who want to be in the fire service, who want to be firefighters, who want to be there. They're not there for, um, you know, on two, off three, uh, work two, surf three, work two, fish three, or my side gig. And everybody's got a side gig and there's nothing wrong with that. But the men and women who want to be there and who want to make the fire service better, I don't think they've changed much. I don't think they've changed much at all. I think what has changed is the administration, the stuff up on top. Okay. And I was talking today with a friend of mine about uh, the firehouse. And very honestly, the one thing that the difference through the years is the hazing. Now, I don't have a problem with practical jokes. People call it hazing. I don't have a problem with practical jokes in the firehouse. I think it's hysterical. They got me numerous times. I mean, I remember sitting in my favorite easy chair and a minute or two later, my butt is soaking wet. They soaked the cushion. Okay. <laughs> and I'm like, you sons of you. Right. And I was like, man, they got me. Okay. They got me. I'm the captain. I get them. I get them bigger. I go a different route. They put on a linguine and clam sauce lunch. And I'm like, okay, let's get on the rig. We're going out. Where are we going? We've got to take a ride around the neighborhood. My ass is wet. I want to dry it off. We're going to drive around for about an hour. We come back and the linguine is a solid lump. Okay. Well, maybe that wasn't a good idea to get the captain's ass wet. Okay. <laughs> you know, whatever it is. I mean, as a lieutenant, they got me. As a fireman, they got me. I don't have any problem. If you're not having fun in the firehouse, you're doing something wrong. But there have been cases, and I have seen, where it involves sexual behavior, uh, things like that. Nothing should hurt anybody. Nothing should be of a sexual nature. But if they hit you with a bucket full of water, it's not a big deal, okay? You're not the wicked witch of the West, and you're going to melt. I'm melting. And some of you won't even get that reference. But... <laughs> It's not that, okay? I was a fireman. They hung me off the roof of a building, and they hit me with the mop water from the day, okay? And it was disgusting. And then they hit me with some flour, and they looked at me, and they said, you got anything to say? I took my helmet off, and I said, yeah, you missed a spot. Back then, I had hair. And they laughed, and they said, oh, this guy's great. Okay, let him down. Go, ch go change your clothes. Yeah, okay. Um, I don't have a problem with that. I don't have a problem... You know, they used to mess with the coffee. I don't have a problem with it. You know, you taste the sugar and the salt are mixed up. I I don't have a problem with that. You should have fun in the firehouse, and it should be okay. But it shouldn't be anything that hurts anybody or anything that uh, is of any nature of sexual, religious, anything that anybody is going to take in any way, shape, or form. But if you're not laughing and having a good time together as a family, you're doing something wrong. I love that. I absolutely love that. Uh, Jim Platt wants to know, Captain, can you talk about the mentor program that is used for the FDNY to become that informed about the building systems? Well, the mentoring system is we pass on. If there is a building in your area that you go to and you find something you don't like, you get out, you go back to the firehouse and you write a letter. And the letter's to everyone who responds on that box on the first alarm. And it says, you know, 123 Main Street, holes in the floor throughout. They're renovating it, but it's going to be a year 
do not go in this building in a heavy smoke condition. Okay. And you call the dispatcher and say, this is the address. One, two, three main street. Who is the first engine? Who is the second engine? Who is the third engine? Who is the fourth engine? First truck, second truck, third truck, rescue squad, the first two battalions and the deputy. And you send them all this letter. And then you put it into the computer system. So if that address comes up and there's other people there from because you're at a different fire, they're relocated. But you pass that knowledge along. And then when you put it together, you go to your officers and you go, take the guys to this building. When you go out for drill, take the guys, bring the engine with you, go to this building, look at this building, spend some time getting to know this building. Um if you have a building in your administrative area, in your area, that scares you, you should spend time there at least every other week. You, if there's a building that you're afraid of, you should drill on it. You get new men and women, you should drill them on this building. You should practice on these things all the time. If there's something you drive by and go, oh, I hate, hope we never get a fire in that building. You should be there all the time because it's going to happen. I love it. Kyle Romagus, he's asking, Cap, are there any tactics that are not well known to the masses that Jake's and the FDNY consistently used that were vindicated by the new studies? Not that I really know of. I mean, breaching a wall, we breached a wall a couple of times to get to fires with hose lines through other apartments. But I think that's now um, gone away of the floor below nozzle. And I think the floor below nozzle is a great tool. Get water in the space. You know, if you can't get down the hallway, you got to get water in there someplace else to cool this down. So I don't think there were that many. I mean, there are a lot of little tricks uh, I have seen guys do. Uh, I always passed one on. I used to call it the fork trick. Um and all it was was a simple trick, and it was a trick for us. When we broke down an apartment door, because we had to go in because there was water leaking or there was gas leaking and nobody was home, you'd have to wait for the police to secure the apartment. Well, sometimes the police would take an hour or two. We used to take, and uh, I don't have a fork with me, but we would take a fork and we would put it on the door. And I'd say to the guys, okay, go find me a, a piece of twine or a shoelace. And I would put it on the lock put the fork on the lock, stand it up and have the lock right ready to turn and see which way I had to pull it to get it to lock. And I put the fork on it, go outside, pull the shoelace. It would click that lock and the apartment was secure. We could go home at four o'clock in the morning. There's nothing greater than that. Guys are like, where'd you learn that? Some old timer showed me that when I was up in Harlem as a fireman. He said, do this, bink. Okay. And we did. Um, you know, there were a lot of things we did. OK, we would put a ladder up, send the guy, lock the door from the inside and send the guy out the ladder on the window. Now, somebody was you asked earlier, and I do, do want to say this one. We used to go into apartments all the time and really didn't think about it. But a lot of brothers and sisters have been shot at recently. Um, I will not put people in an area where I think they could get in trouble with that. That's one of the tactics that I'm um, very, very um, – I, I taught with some people down in Maryland where the guy was shot doing a welfare check and everything else. Very, very aware of that. These people might think you are coming in there to break in, okay, and very aware of that. And just think about those things because I don't want to get a brother or sister shot. Sure going in to do a welfare check or anything like that. So be aware of where you're putting your people. And if I'm doing something like that, I'm probably using the wrap, the hydro ram, the hydraulic door opening tool and staying out of the door. Off to the side, just staying yep. out of that. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Love it. Yep. Which, uh, we already been talking about it, but, uh, leadership actions, actions, uh, Leadership and actions on the fire ground, basically. What was your leadership style when it came to the emergency scene, the fire ground? Um, we worked as a unit. If somebody said something to me, I expected them to do it. My leadership style is you have a job on the fire ground, whatever your job is. Okay. If you are the roof firefighter, you are the outside vent, the irons forces the door, 
the can brings the two and a half gallon water pressurized extinguisher and a hook. And we go in and we do our job. I'm going in with you and I'm leading the case charge. We're going in together. Okay. My thing is if I assign you something to do or ask you to do something, you have to communicate to me. Okay. If I said to my OV, I remember one time going to a fire and saying to my OV, Hey, Pete, can you take the front glass? It's getting hot in here. Want to want to get this out of here? And he's like, Cap, I'm in the back with a portable eye to get the victim out of the window. And I hear my chauffeur say, Cap, are you clear of that front window? And I said, yeah, Tommy, I'm clear. He goes, the aerial will be through there in 20 seconds. Bing, took all the glass out of the front window. Perfect. Okay. I like that communication, that back and forth. Okay. I don't care if you're the newest guy on the fire ground. If you see something, listen, if I had a nickel for every time I missed something on the fire ground, I'd have my own private island in the Bahamas. Okay. If you see something, say something. We're a team. If you think I missed something, which I do, free, I did frequently, let me know. Talk to me. Hey, did you see that? Did you see that? Okay. Did I miss something? Occasionally I did. Yep. More coming at you. Okay. I'm looking here. We, we're talking about leadership a little bit. Fat Baby's Junkyard Dogs. That's, that's a heck of a name said. I have noticed a lot of departments struggling with leadership. People are getting put in positions that chase paper, and it's easy for city's administration to check boxes with paperwork instead of the right fit. Is there something that can change this? Well, very honestly, um, leadership is a two-way street. Okay? You can lead from the bottom. You can lead being a fireman, okay, uh, if you're willing to go out and put the work in. Leadership is about work. It's not easy, and it's not fun, okay? It can be great. It pays great dividends, but leadership is a two-way street. If you're in a place where the guy is just checking boxes, and I've had some people, I remember saying to my senior man one time, Jimmy Tierney, we got a guy who had been promoted and had been working in the boats. So he hadn't been to a fire in 10 years. And the guy goes, I'm kind of scared because I haven't done this in 10 years. What do I do? And he came up and he talked to us. And we're like, we'll walk you through it. Let's go. And we took him. We told him what to do. And he's like, oh, this is great. Okay, you got to call for water now. Oh, okay. Call for water. Water. Send me water. Okay, it's on the way. We had a great time. Because the guy was willing. So I said to this guy, Jimmy Tierney, one time, I said, oh, look, they're sending us another guy. And he goes, exactly. You know why, Michael? And I said, no, why, Mr. T? And he goes, because they know we will do our job, whether we have a leader or not. And we will either bring them up or they will decide they don't want to be here and leave. And I was like, okay. Okay, I'm looking. I changed my whole paradigm, my whole shift. I was like, they're just using us as a dumping ground. But no, they're doing something different. So leadership is a lot of work doing it. But I don't care if you're in the lowest position in the firehouse. You can lead by going out and starting pulling tools off the rig, cleaning out cabinets, wash, washing and waxing the fire truck. Um, leadership is always a, a, a good thing. Um, one of my other favorite stories is I was a young fireman with a friend of mine, Gregory. We were at our quarters and a guy backed in and it was a three-star chief. And he looks and he says, um, is the captain of the truck working today? And we said, yes, he is, sir. And we're all saluting. Do you want the men? No, no, no. no I just want to go upstairs to see the captain. And I said, okay, let me announce you, chief. And he goes, no, 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 no. I'll just walk upstairs. I know where it is. And we call it the bitch box. It was the intercom chief walked up there and he backed his car into quarters and we, you know, backed his car. Come on in chief. And, um, we backed his car into quarters and he started going upstairs. We got on the bitch box and we're like, Hey cap, there's some chief coming up to see you. Three stars. He goes, okay, tough for Thank you. And then me and my friend, Greg, look at this guy's car. And it is disgusting. I mean, there's uh, soda cans in the back seat. There's fast food wrappers on the floor. It's dirty. It's disgusting. So I looked at my buddy Greg. I said, this is disgusting. Three-star chief in the FDNY and this piece of shit. I said, get the bucket. Let's wash this thing. And we cleaned it all out. We threw all the, the crap out. We cleaned it all up. We washed it. We dried it off. And the chief was upstairs with my captain for about 40 minutes. And he came down and he looked at his car and he goes, what the hell happened to my car? 
I said, we cleaned it, chief. And he's like, that's not your job. I said, I'm sorry, chief, but it is. And he said, excuse me? I said, well, you parked it in my firehouse, and I don't want the neighbors in this place to think we park pieces of crap looking like that in our firehouse. It was disgusting. People walking by are looking in the window going, what the hell? They think we're not a good company. There is no way that got to stay here. So we cleaned it. Chief looked at my captain and said, Danny, well done. Got in his car and drove away. Captain looks at us and says, boys, well done. Hit the bells. The truck's going out. What are we going out for, Cap? I'm buying you guys Italian ices. Let's go. And we went out and we got Italian ices. It's leadership. Where you can lead from anywhere, any organization, yeah. if you're willing to do it. Willing to put in that work, man. That is a beautiful story. I love that. Um, Jake Deal wants to know, Cap, what in all of your years of service, in your opinion, is the best part of the job? Best part of the job, and I'm retired now, so the thing I miss the most is being on the fire truck after a fire, being on the rig after a job. I used to call it snotty and smiling, okay? All the petty bullshit, and excuse my language, but all the petty bullshit in the firehouse disappears. He made Brussels sprouts. I hate Brussels sprouts. You know, I don't like fish. They made fish for dinner. All of that's gone. What would you have? Where did you go? Who went there? What did you see when you got there? How was the door? Did you get the door? What happened? That is the thing that I love the most. When we have come together and done our job and done it well. And even if we had a problem, we sat down and talked about it and figured out what the problem was. But after a fire, when the men and women are willing to sit down and communicate and they're willing to listen. I also was blessed to have some great senior people. In my company, I remember going to the firehouse one night and uh, we had a job and I had had my senior man telling me beforehand that maybe we were drilling too much. And that night we had a fire and something happened and I still to this day don't know what it was. And my senior man said, hey, Cap, we're going to have a drill in the kitchen. I said, "Okay, I'll be in in a minute. He goes, you're not invited. Go take a shower. Okay. Okay. That's leadership. That's my senior man leading. Something happened. I didn't see. He didn't want to get anybody in trouble, but he wanted to correct the situation for the company. So when I wasn't there, when one of my regular lieutenants wasn't there, when some poor covering guy was there, it didn't happen to them. And he took the initiative. He led and did the job. So I think leadership comes through in so many different ways. And you just have to be willing to put in that work. Love it. Uh, Jesse Small says, Cap, what uh, what's some ways you found through the years as a leader officer to motivate younger firemen to work around the station, be passionate about the job, and want to train? By doing it yourself. Mm, boom. By walking the walk. Going out. Come on, guys. We're going to drill. Now, I remember being a, a senior captain, and I'd go to a drill, and a guy would say, oh, you don't have to do this. The hell I don't. If my guys are doing this, they're going out a window. You're putting us in a fire scenario and making us bail out a window? Well, when I go to a fire with them, I want them to trust that I'm going to bail out with them. And I'm not going to bail out first. I'm going to be the last one out that window. And I said, there is no way I am not going out that window. I am doing it. And so I think you have to be willing to do it yourself. If you want to motivate young people and you want to capture them, you have to be willing to do that. Okay? There are a lot of places where guys and girls go in there to work on their second job. They have, you know, do we cheat them and how tax firm or they're an architect and they're drawing up plans in their little bunk room. And I think the best way to motivate, to capture these people is to go out and do it. We had a fire in this building. You know, what's weird about this building. This is a weird layout. These apartments go, some of them go in this way. They go in that way. Uh, weird buildings that you have. Um, we had ours in, in Brooklyn. We had Rutland houses that they were the duplex apartments, very similar to that fire where the 17 people died in the Bronx. But you went in and you went up to the third floor and the apartments went in and down or in and up. Okay. So there was three, six, nine, and those were the floors of this building. 
Whoa. So that's a weird building. Yeah. So you have to know where you're going, and you have to know how that building is laid out. You want your people to get good at it, you take them in there, you drill them on it. You practice. You walk that walk. You walk that walk. You talk that talk. Nice. There you go. <laughs> Someone said that's a mic drop moment. That's beautiful. Uh, Patrick Work has said, Captain, thoughts on today's lithium-ion battery symposium at The Rock? I thought it was excellent. I thought it was excellent. The information was amazing. I thought the guys were phenomenal. I think that we are going to see uh, more and more of this. And as the FDNY said, they didn't even have, the fire marshals didn't have an availability to classify them as lithium ion battery fires until just recently. But some guys were going back as far as 2014 to look at some of these fires where they had. Um, the numbers they have, and I don't have my notes in front of me, but I think it's 147 fires so far this year involving lithium ion batteries, and I think five fatalities. Oh, wow. Um, and, you know, um, Saturday, my old company, Ladder 123, they made a couple of kids. They got, grabbed a couple of kids in an apartment on the 12th floor of the Albany houses. Okay. Um, they're happening frequently. They're happening frequently, and a lot of places have not quantified the data. They don't, they're not looking at where it's coming from. So we have to start looking at those things. But I thought the information was phenomenal. I really learned a lot there. Love it, man. And, and you got more coming tomorrow, don't you? Yes. Yeah, they're doing, they're burning a couple of them tomorrow. We're getting to see them fire off. You got to, is there going to be some video? I, there is some video out there. And, uh, yeah, the FDNY stuff is out there. And there's some stuff on uh, YouTube. If you plug in lithium-ion battery stuff, there's a ton of material out there. Right on. Right on. Um, actions in the firehouse. I wanted to get to this because I got to catch This House Rocks, at least a condensed version of it with you and Mikey G. Mm -hmm. Mike Galliano, your, your compadre. Um, oh, yeah. I love the class, man. I only got the short version. I haven't got the full version. So, but okay. it's a great class. Everyone out there should should be uh, mandatory to take the class if you get a chance. Do so. Uh, I'm not asking you to give the class here today, but talk about some of the key points for having a firehouse that rocks. Firehouse that rocks is, I mean, it becomes all of these things that are together. Okay, it's a vision where we want to go. Okay, where we want to get this firehouse. Okay, it's a vision. OK, and it's understanding where we are now. The easiest person to lie to in the entire world is you. You can lie to yourself easier than anybody else. OK, so you have to have a vision of where you want the firehouse to go, where you are presently. OK, and then you have to develop trust. OK, trust in a firehouse is huge because if I tell you something and I'm not doing what I tell you I'm doing, or if I'm doing something or I'm doing something just for me, not for the firehouse, if you are there only for you, you're in the wrong profession. Okay? Go to Wall Street or someplace else. But you're there for the brothers and sisters. You're there for all of us. Make us all better. Okay? We're only as good as our weakest link. So that's part of it. Training is part of it. Okay? Taking trust. Training. Okay? Taking initiative. Looking at how we do these things and then having fun and doing it as a family, making it all together. If we build this together as leadership, as trust, as a common vision, we lead ourselves, we've, we question each other. I let you question me. If I do something wrong, you talk to me. OK, I make mistakes. Listen, I am that person and I try to be better. I teach this stuff. I talk about communication all the time. I have my seven high habits of highly effective people sitting up on my thing. Okay. I have my crucial conversations book sitting up here. I nice. use my crucial conversations all the time. When I first started taking crucial conversations, they sent me to a three day class on this. I loved this stuff. Why would a regional, reasonable, rational person do these things? And I look at these things. And all of this works together to make us better. Trust, communication, training, okay? We love each other. We're a family. Let's get this together so we can take this vision and move it forward. 
and get better at what we do. It's an amazing thing. The firehouse is the greatest thing in the world. I love it, man. I absolutely love it. Going here and saying, uh, same question before, which you kind of touched on it with the, with the, the hazing and the practical jokes and things like that. But what's been your biggest takeaway throughout your career from start to when you finished and current when it comes to leadership around the firehouse? If you're doing it right, if you're doing it right as the designated leader, the captain, the chief, whatever, you're not doing much. Nice. Because your men and women have been properly trained and they know what to do. And the best part about that is they know what you expect them to do, even if you're not there. Okay. You're leading when you're sitting home, you're on a vacation, you're sitting on a beach in the Caribbean, but you're leading because you have trained those men and women, what you expect of them at a fire, at an operation, how they treat people, how they treat the civilians and everything else. And your leadership skills grow. And as your leadership, as the people you have worked with and have trained in that leadership, now they start to spread out in the organization and now the organization is getting better as a whole because of the work you put in and you did for these people. And I think that's a huge, huge, huge ish, uh, benefit yes. for the agency, for everybody. I mean, a house that is a stepping stone is a great firehouse because people are going there to get better at what they do so they can move on and better the organization. And I love that. I love that. Beautiful, man. Uh, yeah, if you get a chance to catch this house rocks, and that's what Shane Faru said. This house rocks is a great class. Was lucky to catch it at FDIC this year. No, 100%. If you get a chance, catch it 100%. Uh, Joe Rukshin says, as a, and I hope I got your name right. Uh, you can add some pronunciation in the, in the chat. But as a platoon chief, I find some of my greatest struggles are being able to consistently motivate officers. I've done the job, put in all the work, worked side by side with my firefighters as a captain, but now, as a platoon chief, I am administratively distanced from my men. Like it or not, any thoughts on productive methods of officer development? Yep. My biggest thing? Go sit down and talk to him. Okay? Um, our current chief of department, Jack Hodges, chief of department of the FDNY, was a battalion chief, came into my battalion, the 3A battalion, and came in and looked at me and he said, hey, Mike. You got a couple of minutes? Yeah, chief. Mind if we get a cup of coffee? No, chief. We go sit down in the kitchen and he goes, I want to talk to you. I want to find out what you do in the firehouse. What are your operations? How do you run this company? How do you do things? Because we were in a unique situation. Uh, Rescue 2 was very close to our quarters and we ran in with Rescue 2 a lot. And he wanted to know how we handled it and what we did. And from a company officer, that's a great thing. So now you're a chief. Go sit down and have lunch with your officers. Go have a coffee break. Hey, listen, just want to sit down and talk to you. Tell you I'm here for you. Want to find out. I know, you know, I don't see as much as I'd like to with all this paperwork they have me doing. But what can I do for you? What can I help you with? What can I do for you? What do you need from me? Nice. And how can I make things better for you? I don't think you can get a better answer, man. I absolutely love the fact that you, you, you say, show up and say, what do you need? Yeah. I love it, man. Uh, I like it. Jason Schneider asking a question here. Cap, I'm going to write down what I, yeah, I'm going to write down my answer, what I think you're going to say. So it's right there and say, Cap, what do you think is the most important trait of a leader, regardless of rank? Honesty. And humility go hand in hand. Uh, you got to be honest. You got to be honest because the moment they don't think you're telling them the truth, they're never going to hear anything you say. And you got to be humble. Okay. And you got to understand that you're leading leaders. You're leading the men and women who are going to lead this department. Okay. You're leading the people who might be your boss someday. And I, I'm fine with that. But I am, I'm nobody. Okay, but I want these people to be somebody. 
And I'm going to work to make sure that they understand that I expect them to be the best they can be. Okay. And some guys like myself get to a point where they're comfortable and they like it. Other guys get to a point. They want to keep moving up the rank. Go for it. I love it. Good for you. Okay. But be comfortable where you are. Be happy where you are. And then help everybody else. Give them a hand up. Give them a hand up. Help them. Get Make them better. Nice. Rich Anderson, Cap, what do you look for in potential members to join your company and help move it forward according to your vision? What do you look for? I look for drive. I look for that honesty. And I also look for what they want to bring to the table. Okay, why do you want to come here? Do I? Do you want to go to fires? Well, everybody wants to go to fires. What makes you a little different? Um, what do What do you have to offer? What's your background? Um, I've had s- some great guys. I've had guys who um, have worked for me who had more certificates and documentation than uh, probably the Library of Congress. And couldn't put a fire out in a paper bag. And then I've had other guys who came in and said, listen, I just want to learn how to do my job. I want to learn how to be better. I want to get good at what I do. And I'm like, I want him. Right on. I want her. I want to get better. I want you to help me get, I want to get sets and reps and do this better. I want to learn how to be better. You're in. Come on. I'll take you. Okay, that's what I want. I want the people who want to do more. We're the only service in the world, probably, but we're the only definite civil service that says, I want to do more. I want to do more. Okay, I want to go to more fires. I want to do more. Do you think cops want to go to more car accidents? They want to go to more shootings? They want to go to that? Do you think garbage men want to pick up more garbage? No. Do firemen want to go to more fires? Damn right they do. Yes, they do. Okay. They do. So what do you want from here? That's what I want to know. That's what I'm looking for. Love it. All right. Coming at you on, we wanted to talk about mental health and how the job can affect it. Uh, how has the approach to mental health changed over the decades? Like, Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. Um, I got a, I got a book the other day from my brother and it has a picture of my dad in 1943 he was not yet 23 years old and he was a co-pilot on a b-29 bomber okay and i don't know i might be able to show this to you i hope no, you i can po- I, I saw i think you post you posted this i posted on facebook. it on yes. facebook i, posted I love it on the facebook. story i love the story go okay but let me see if i can get this yes okay i don't know if you can see the picture there but you can tell which one is my dad because look at the heights. The six foot five guy. Six foot five guy is my dad. But he came back from World War II. There was no mental health. He drank. My dad was a drinking guy. He drank all the time. Okay. When he retired, they started drinking at noon. They started every day drinking at noon. Okay. He drank. Okay. When I first got on the job, they had fires. We drank. We self-medicated. Go home, you couldn't sleep? Bing. I remember coming home one morning at 9 o'clock in the morning. Now, we worked weird shifts in the FDNY, and we won't go into that. But our shifts mostly start at night and go to the next night. Mostly. Okay? But I remember coming home one morning at 9 o'clock in the morning with a six-pack of Budweiser in my hand. And my wife is laying up in bed, and I come in, and I got a six-pack of Budweiser, and I'm popping a beer, and I'm drinking a cold Budweiser. And she looks at me, she goes, kind of early isn't it and i was going to answer my typical answer back then you can't drink all day if you don't start in the morning but no i said to her really my answer was i haven't been to bed yet so i'm going to bed in a little bit but i want to have i want to relax so i had two or three beers and i went to bed okay we had fatal fires we had that schomburg fire we lost seven people uh one of them was a 12 year old girl she and her two brothers jumped out the 34th floor window Okay. Uh, when I made my rescue, the guy um, lost his two kids. It was December 23rd. 
It was two days before Christmas. Lost his two kids. The father made a push that was unbelievable. We drank. Firehouse humor, gallows humor, we use it frequently. And I, I don't have a problem with it. And I think it's good. But I think the drinking, I think we need people to come in and talk to people. Because I've done a lot of studying on this. And mental health has changed over the decades. And there were great people. Father Judge was one of the people who was around the, the day before on 9-11. But mental health has changed. We now know PTSD, uh, PSD, whatever you want to call it, excuse me, is part of what we do. Most people have traumatic episodes in their lives, four or five. They can count them on one hand. Firefighters can have between two and four hundred. Okay, depending on where they are. Okay, that's if you're a young father, children, car accidents, your kids are out driving a car and you see the same kind of pickup truck that your kid has and you're walking up to it on a car wreck and you're going, please, God, please, God, please, God. Okay, and then you find out it's some other poor slob's kid. Okay. And maybe that kid didn't make it. That's all going to affect you. That's going to be part of what we do. And we used to do nothing for it. Nothing. Now we have peer counselors. We have people going in and talking to you. We have mental health issues. We talk to people. Um, people I know, myself included, meditate. Mental health. We think about things. Um, I take time for my mental health. I have been through therapy. I have gone through the counseling service unit and it's changed dramatically. Listen, if you need help, talk to somebody, find somebody that works for you. Okay. It doesn't have to be the first one. It took me three to find mine, but it's part of what we do. And when you bring it home, the reason I bring it home is because there's a picture I have of me and my two daughters and it was after 9-11, it was December. I hadn't put up any Christmas lights yet or anything else. And my little one who was um, six, going to be seven, came up and looked at me and said, Daddy, why are you always mad? And I looked at my wife who I've been with for over 40 years and she looked at me, and at that time, we had been together for over, well over 20 years. She goes, the kids are afraid of you. That's the biggest punch I ever took in my life. And listen, I used to drink and fight a lot. Biggest punch I ever took in my life. And I had to go find somebody to talk to, and I found my guy. Okay? And it helps. The alternatives are, I, I, I know people who've done it, who have completed suicide. It's a shitty alternative for your family, for your friends, for people, they're always going to question themselves. You might be out of that pain, but they're always going to question themselves and you're putting them in that pain. They're buying, your, you're selling them your pain and it sucks, okay? So if you're going through something, call somebody, talk to somebody, find somebody, put in the work, okay? Because it only gets better. And once you get through that, once you get out that dark side, the difference is amazing. Your relationships, your people, your family, your uh, if you're religious, your faith, all of that stuff gets stronger. It gets better. So mental health is a big issue. If you're in that leadership position, you are a boss, get people in there. Get peer support groups in there. Have business cards. I always have business cards. Okay. Where am I? There I am. Counseling service unit of the FDMY. I was just at my annual medical and a counseling service. I always take the card. I always know if I need something, if something goes wrong, I'm going to have somebody I can talk to. I'm going to call somebody. We call it the FDMY. Phone a friend. Phone a friend. Talk to somebody. Find somebody who can help you and get better. Very, very uh, powerful. I can tell that you're very passionate about that subject. Oh, yeah. Um. Yeah. All right. I'm moving to the point where I like to ask you the book or books that you think firefighters should be reading. Oh my God. You've mentioned two already that I love. So, but but go ahead. Uh, what are we talking about though? Man, what book? It, 
complete like it's your opinion it could be fire service it could be psychology it could be humor i mean 100 percent. but you think firefighters should read um i love military history i read military history all the time uh i have bookshelves full of books um I am reading right now. Um, where did I put it? I think it's in here. Yeah, there it is. Okay. I just read a book from a friend of mine in Australia about Breaker Moran. And if anybody's old like I am, they remember the movie from the 70s, Breaker Moran. And then he sent me an updated version of Breaker Moran from a guy, uh, Fitzsimmons, in Australia. And uh, then I decided I was going to read this guy who was one of the people from Breaker Moran, Scapegoats of the Empire by George Whitson, who was one of the guys charged. And he was originally supposed to be executed. And they oh, wow. executed two guys, soldiers. And uh, he was given a prison term and was finally paroled. But he calls him scale- for Scapegoat of the Empire. So I think you should find something that interests you and follow through on it. I love military history. And I have read uh, books all over the place on military history. Um, I love the um, Getting Better, the self-help books, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Crucial Conversations, uh, things like that. Um, But I will read anything. Um, I also am going on vacation in a couple of weeks. So I have a couple of beach reads. I like to read... um, similar to Louis L'Amour stuff, uh, things like that on the beach or CJ box, something like that on a beach read. That's a fun read when I'm on vacation. So it depends on what I'm reading. But I think if you're talking about military history, uh, we were soldiers once and young by General Moore. Okay. Uh, Seven Roads to Hell, a Screaming Eagle's Diary of a Stone. And um, Donald Burgess's book, um, the Simple Sounds of Freedom, probably one of the best stories I've ever read. Um, it should be a um, – everyone should know the name of that man, okay? And he w- jumped into uh, Jumpin' Joe by Early of The Simple Sounds of Freedom, uh, jumped into uh, Occupied France twice before D-Day carrying uh, gold, 70 pounds of gold each time beforehand, escaped, jumped in on D-Day was captured, escaped, captured again, escaped, captured again, going to be shot, escaped. You can't make this up. The Simple Sounds of Freedom is the true story of the only guy who fought for the Americans and the Russians during World War II. Because when he was got a, well, finally away from the Germans, he ended up on the uh, Russian side. And the Russians said, oh, we'll take you to a camp for Americans. He goes, no, 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 no. I want to fight these Nazis, ba- bastards. I want to fight these people. And they said, okay. And he called them Nazis, and the Russians said to him, no, 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 don't call them Nazis. Okay, they're Gestapo. We're socialists. They're not socialists. And that's what they said to him. Oh, wow. But the, the book is amazing, okay? Okay. But find something you like. There are so many different things I could tell you. Uh, I love to read, so um, I read military history. I have gotten the Marine Corps reading list by rank and i use that a lot for leadership stuff um and just you know i mean if you haven't read the art of war um if you haven't read the bible i mean whatever go out there and read even if you're reading a magazine just to improve your knowledge of the world beautiful hey i wanted to ask you love military history do you have a favorite uh i don't want to say war but favorite era of military I, history. I like the World War II stuff because my dad and my uncles were in it. Sure. Okay. So, I mean, my father flew 65 missions. That's, yes. That's crazy. In a bomber. In a yeah. bomber. And, you know, he always said, listen, I'm on borrowed time. I'm on borrowed time since 1945. I've been on borrowed time. So, um, you know, my father's nickname was either St. Patrick or the Lucky Leprechaun. Because the one time he didn't go up with the crew, the plane was shot down and there were no survivors. Oh, wow. And they used to take a pilot out of one plane, a co-pilot out of another, and a, a navigator out of another. And they would go to Bangor, Maine and pick up the planes in Maine. 
and the Women's Aviation Corps were not allowed to fly outside of the United States. So they would fly at the Maine or to uh, California, depending on which theater it was going to. Now, they would pick it up in Bangor, go to Iceland, and then go over to England, and then from England, wherever the plane was going to go. So he was back getting another plane, and uh, they lost the crew. Wow. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Man, that's yep. amazing. Uh, all right. Captain Mike Dugan, we have a thing we do on the weekly scrap. It's a tradition. It's called the Five Questions for Firefighters. Uh, we did them so much that we finally ran through all the answers pretty much. And people, So we got the next five questions for firefighters. These have been going on for about 40 episodes now. Okay. Uh, so, Captain Mike Dugan, are you ready for the next five questions for firefighters? Sure. sure. The, the points are completely arbitrary. They're assigned by me. The answers are completely your opinion. There is no right or wrong. So here we go. Question number one. What single characteristic makes the difference between a run-of-the-mill firefighter and the top-tier go-to badass firefighter? Motivation. Motivation. Wanting to do the job. Wanting to be better. Wanting to be the best you can. Wanting to do what's right. If you don't know, ask. <clears throat> if you think it needs to be done, it needs to be done. Do it. Okay? And I would rather have guys and girls who did something and did it wrong. But they did it. They did it on their own. They tried. Okay? I'd rather have someone who tried and failed. And someone who just sat in the easy chair all day long. Love it. Dude, I love it, man. Uh, yeah, 100% uh, max points on question number one. Just for the finish, the strong finish. And if anybody asked questions in Facebook, Kyle Romig has caught a fire. So he's been gone. I don't know I don't know how long ago he sent the message that he caught a fire. So he hasn't been looking for questions. So I apologize if your question didn't get through to Mike. Uh, question number two. If you could go back in time and give yourself one piece of advice as a rookie... What would it be? Start a journal. Mm. Start a journal. Start a journal. And take pictures. The brotherhood and sisterhood pictures. Now, I will be honest. I don't like pictures taken on the front lawn of some poor person's house after we've burnt their house down. Okay? But if we stand in front of the rig and take a brotherhood and sisterhood picture, all the members of that crew, okay? Uh, I did a couple before 9-11 with guys I was training with in, in – uh, California, and the next year, uh, one of them was gone from 9-11, and a couple of years after that, the other one was gone from 9-11 cancer. So take a picture. Put down where you went. I remember a lot of fires, but I remember fires because something either went wrong or something went right there. But I don't remember a lot of the things that I wish I had. I wish I had a journal. I wish I kept copies of tickets runs things i went to things that happened okay so i could refresh and go back and relive some of those memories man dude i have uh i don't know how many times i've given young people that advice and i don't even hardly follow it myself you know i, I have a journal and i and it and you can go to it and you can see i get fired up and it'll be like three or four days or weeks that i, that I put something in it and then you'll see a three-year gap Yep. You know, and it's yep. just, man, I wish that dude, that is such a powerful piece of advice. hundred percent. Very Go. honestly, it's so easy now because of the computer yeah. and talk to text. Yeah. No, hundred percent, man. Max points, man. If that, if that's all you get out of this scrap, that is, I love it. Uh, cap, what is number three? What is your favorite training drill? Forcible entry. Keys to the kingdom. Open the doors. Easy answer. Okay, that's easy. Uh, yeah. When we used to have guys getting promoted to lieutenant, uh, that we would give them the front seat and let them ride as the officer. And I would ride backwards and take the irons. And they would. And a couple of times we caught some good jobs. And I remember guys saying to me, you didn't bring the hydro ram. If I need the hydro ram, I'm putting in my papers and I'm retiring. If I can't get through that door with conventional forcible entry, I'm putting in papers and I'm retiring. OK, forcible entry, know how to work the tools, practice, practice, practice. OK, drill it in the firehouse. It's easy to make a forcible entry door. Work on it. Also, go out and build up some relationships in your area. If you have a lumberyard, damaged doors, we'll take them from you and we'll give you a, um, a notice that 
we took these damaged doors so you can write them off on your taxes as a donation and then we can use them in the firehouse as a forcible entry job perfect everybody wins Love home it. depots walmarts whatever do you have any damaged equipment we'll take it make our drills better forcible entry work 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 on the forcible entry there you go you know he is a passionate man about truck work max points on number three number four what mistake have you learned the most from in your fire service career? Um, oh, this is a good one. I teach. I taught in the captain's development. I did the crucial conversations. I taught the captain's management program in the FDNY. And I went into the firehouse one morning. And my senior guy was pacing, waiting for me. And I went in. And he's like, we need to talk. And I'm like, oh, something's going on. Well, there was a problem. And it was a problem with the chief officer. And the chief did something and that he shouldn't have done. And this was after the incident in New York City where the gentleman of a firehouse up in the Bronx took a young lady into the firehouse and um, had sex with her on duty. And um, it wasn't a good thing. And um, then she said that she was raped. And it, the whole thing. So everything changed in a heartbeat. We were on the front page of every paper in the New York City. And this chief was yelling at my guys about they had to follow all the new rules. And then that night, he wasn't going to follow them. Because he just, it just for the next uh, 18 hours, we're not going to follow the rules because it impacts me. And I went in and I went off. I lost my temper. I let my emotions. And anybody who knows anything about human nature, you can communicate or you can fight. But you can't do both. Okay? And we went to a stand up. Stand up wasn't it was a, a screaming match on the apparatus floor between me and this chief. And he said some things about my firehouse and my guys and me. And I told him, well, OK, I'll just call headquarters and tell them this is what's going on. And he told me to F off and corrected the situation. Well, my guys wanted to lift me up on their shoulder and carry me around the firehouse. But this whole thing blew up and I didn't handle it correctly. I could have handled it a lot better because I let my emotions get to me. So the thing that I will tell every brother or sister out there is to take 15, 20 minutes, calm down, think it through. Let that, all of that adrenaline, that dopamine, whatever else is, all of that stuff that's running around your brain, swallow it, eat it, get rid of it. And then think about what you want to do. How are you going to make this right? Okay. Now, it turned out, took a while, but the chief and I became friends. We worked everything out. It took a while, but my guys were like, you know, screw him. We're not going to cook for the chief. We're not going to clean for the chief. I'm like, absolutely not. Guys, this is between me and him. You guys have nothing to do with this. You're going to do everything the way you did it before. And you're going to take care of it. It's going to be between me and him. And then the other chiefs came in that night and asked what happened. And I told them exactly what happened. And I said, you know, the chief blew up at my guys screaming at them, tearing them apart. And then Four days later, he's like, shh, we're not going to tell anybody that I'm going to break the rules. You guys are pieces of shit. You can't break the rules, but shh, I'm going to break the rules. And I lost it. And I don't like that. And it's something I regret to this day, that I let my emotions get the best of me. And I didn't get the full story. So now... I tell people, before you make that rash decision, before you make sure you get the whole system, the whole story, the whole thing down for everything. 
okay, and what's going on. Love it, man. Hundred percent max points. I, I man, it took you can communicate or you can fight, but you can't do both, man. That is that one actually. Uh, yeah, max points four for four. Number five, final question: Heavy fire and searchable space. Would you rather be assigned to the nozzle or first in on VES? Come on, right that's now. a no-brainer. I, I know, that's a no-brainer. Listen, I love my brothers and sisters in the engine, but. On, off, on, off. Okay, that's the bail. That's what you got to do. Okay, getting in the window, getting in the, the doorway, the searchable space, finding out, going as far as you can to the fire, confining it, and then searching from there out. Searchable space is it, bro. There's nothing better. And there's nothing better than getting that grip, changing someone's life. You're yeah. doing God's work. If someone is alive in this world, because of you. And I mean, I joke with my friends who are medics and EMTs, you know, uh, EMS, every minute sucks and everything else. But I get hurt. I want my medics and my EMTs on me like, you know, stink on shit. I want them all over me. But if you've done CPR and brought somebody back, you saved this choking child. You've gone to a fire and rescued a kid. You've rescued another human being. You've done God's work. Okay, that person is alive because of you. And guess what? And this goes back almost to the mental health cell. Every once in a while, it doesn't work. And you don't make the difference. But you tried. And you gave them more than more of a chance than they would have had on their own. So you did the right thing. You made it better for your being there. And you also made that person's family feel better for you being there so i think that the searchable space making a grab is what it's all about might be the easiest max points i've ever assigned to a question and there it is the five questions for firefighters according to captain mike dugan and that officially makes it 156 scraps in the books uh cap if someone wants to get a hold of you book a class or just reach out to you in some way shape or form what's the best way to do that my email and it's real simple. My email is my last name, Dugan, D-U-G-A-N, fire, F-I-R-E, at AOL.com. I know I'm old. I still have an AOL mail address. But you know what? I've had it for so long that I'm not going to change it, okay? And uh, give me, a sh drop me a line. Ask me about anything. If you got any questions, um, if you send me something, just put it in what you're looking for. Uh, I will, uh, if anybody wants uh, some of the reading lists, I have my top, I can't keep it to 10 books. I have 13 books that I send to everybody Ooh, nice. that I will send to you uh, without a problem. I will also send you copies that I have been shared with my friends in the military, the Marine Corps reading list. Um, not a problem. I like to share the information. So if you got any questions, shoot me a line. I'd love to help you. I'm firing. I'm, I'm going to send off for the the 13 and the read, the Marine Corps reading list one as soon as I as soon as we're done. Uh, 100%. Okay. Uh, wrapping it up. Housekeeping. Uh, Firehousevigilance.com. Go there if you want to be part of the vigilantes. Uh, join us. Uh, man, we're having a lot of fun as the vigilantes. If you want to be a part of it, go to Firehousevigilance.com. Uh, you can support the scrap there and and get the invite to be a part of that group. Last month we discussed uh, uh, it's your ship. Uh, oh, great book. Yeah, great book, man. Mike Abershoff. Yes. Phenomenal book. Phenomenal uh, book. A lot of fun. This the, we, we vote each month on what book to read for the month, and everybody voted on On Combat by Grossman. But when we went to order the book on Amazon, it said it would take two or three weeks to get the book. Okay. So which And it's a big book. So we're going to read that one next month. So it gives us two months to read it. This month we're going to listen to a podcast, and we're voting on that right now. And then we're going to discuss that. But it's a lot of fun. So if you want to be a part of it, go to firehousevigilance.com. Uh, it's a blast. Uh, where else was I at? Uh, the Scraps Your Killer lineup continues because, man, Devin Craig followed by Mike Dugan. And then next week we got Robbie Townsend, then Dina Ali, Chad Bootsin, Bill Gustin, and then Jay Bonifield. So it's it's been a crazy summer leading into fall. Uh, what what a what an unbelievable lineup of guests on the Scrap. Does it get any better than that is what I want to know. Uh, excuse me, I'm about to sneeze. Well. He's got a sinus infection, so we got to let that go. Okay. Uh, 
please go. I, 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 everybody, if you listen to the podcast, the audio form, go rate it five stars uh, and leave a review. It helps out a lot. If you do so, take a screenshot of it, send it to me, and I will send you a sticker pack. Uh, you'll get lots of cool stickers, all five of them. Logo, Firehouse Vigilance, the Vigilant Creed, the helmet sticker rounds, Scrappy, and oops, get them up right. If I can do it right. Yeah. And then finally, of course, Scrappy and the Mutts Don't Scrap. So, rate it. Send me a screenshot. You will get a sticker pack. That's me bribing you to go rate the podcast. Uh, other than that, I cannot say thank you enough, Mike Dugan, for being an unbelievable guest and giving me your evening and sharing it with the fire service. Thank you very much, brother. It's been a pleasure. For the audience out there, uh, thank you so much. Without you, without the questions, the scrap would be nothing. To the sponsors, Keyhose, Elkhart Brass, Affordable Drill Towers, and Fire Mall Tools, thank you so much. Uh, I love you all. Mutts, don't scrap. I hope the tone stays silent unless it is burning. Everybody stay safe out there.